So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Tracy McWhorter. She is a vegan trailblazer, public health nutrition expert, speaker, and author. Tracy is passionate about inspiring people to live healthier, happier lives. Her best-selling book is titled, By Any Greens Necessary, a revolutionary guide for black women who want to eat green, get healthy, lose weight, and look fat. Tracy McWhorter. Hello, Worcester. How are you all doing? Good. Thank you so much for your patience. We literally, I literally just got off the plane and um, Victoria drove me over here. So I, I and the, the plane was delayed 45 minutes. So I appreciate your patience. I'm very excited to be here. So I have to cut my presentation a little short. Um, and um, but again, if you have any questions, we, we can handle that. Talk a little bit more down at the table. So let me just. Um, tell you a little um, more about me and my story, um, how I actually um, came to be doing what I'm doing, going, going around and promoting veganism. I actually um, have written this book, um, By Any Greens Necessary, it came out last May 2010, and it is um, doing very well. How many of you have the book? Good. I saw you brought in three, so thank you. <laughs> Four. Four? Uh -oh. All right. So um, the book is doing really well. It's in its second printing. It's considered a national bestseller at this point, so it's, I'm very thrilled about that, obviously. But also, it's exciting because it means that folks are just very, very interested. This is a fabulous time to be talking about veganism, plant-based foods, and eating healthier. And wherever I go and talk, folks come up to me or they email me or if I'm in the grocery store in D.C. Uh, where I'm from, people tell me that they um, have used the book to help them lose weight, to lower their cholesterol, lower their blood pressure, um, to encourage their family members, their partners, their co-workers to start considering eating more plant-based food. So I'm really excited about that and that's very very important that's the goal that was my point in writing the book and i have been a vegan for 23 years i'll be 45 um, in september hopefully thank you thank you i'm glad you're surprised that, that's the point and um i um never ever thought that i would be promoting healthy eating that I would be a healthy eater as an adult. Um, I was here um, in Boston in October at the Boston Vegetarian Food Festival, yay, and um, told, this, um, told this story also that growing up, I hated vegetables, I hated healthy food, and we had a ritual in my house. I have two older sisters, and I would be the last one at the table before, you know, just pushing vegetables around on my plate because I didn't want to eat them. So I'd be there for about an hour, then my mother would come back in the kitchen and put her foot down and say, eat your peas, eat your Brussels sprouts, eat those carrots, you know. So I'd eat them and then we'd go through the same thing the next night. And in fact, I was such an unhealthy eater that I used to dip the bacon back in the grease can on the stove, right? So can anybody, Remember the grease can on the stove? Does anybody still have the grease can on the stove? Okay, good. That's not a good thing. So, um, my sanctuary was school. At school, we could eat all you can eat. And so, a girlfriend of mine um, and I, whenever they served chocolate pudding for dessert, we would spend our recess in the lunchroom eating trays and trays of chocolate pudding. So if it was sweet, if it was creamy, if it was greasy, I loved it. That's how I ate when I wasn't at home. And so um, in the seventh grade, I was introduced to vegetarianism. I had two teachers um, who were vegetarian. And I um, attended Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. From, from third through twelfth grade. Our seventh grade teachers decided that our class camping trip should be all vegetarian. I thought this was a horrible idea, so I wrote a petition, <laughs> tried to get my classmates to sign it, only two or three of them did at the most, and I was overruled by my teachers, and so for our camping trip we had granola, peanut butter and honey sandwiches on whole wheat bread and fruit juice. 
I thought this was absolutely horrible and crazy. Never gave vegetarianism a second thought. Then fast forward seven years, I'm a sophomore at Amherst College right here in Massachusetts. This is not yet, you went to Amherst? Yeah. Okay, you're from the area, I was gonna say. Okay, um, and um, so my sophomore year, our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus to talk about the state of Black America. Instead, Dick Gregory, knowing that he had a captive audience of college students from the five college area, decided that he was going to talk about the plate of black America and, how, and about how unhealthfully um, most folks eat. And so I immediately thought back to my seventh grade teachers who were vegetarian and I thought, okay, well, Dick Gregory is crazy too. <laughs> and I tried to tune him out because honestly, if I had known he was going to be talking about vegetarianism, I would not have shown up. No way. Um, so I tried to tune him out, and what really struck me about his talk, he talked for about two and a half hours, was when he started to trace the path of a hamburger from a cow on a factory farm through the slaughterhouse process to a fast food restaurant, to a clogged artery, to a heart attack. And I do mean graphically. And so I'm not going to do that for you today, but that is what got me. I had never ever heard anything like that before in my life. I had never made an association between what I ate and my health. And so I remember sitting there just kind of stunned because this talk was right before lunch. And mind you, I was somebody who ate hamburgers and hot dogs every single day. My freshman year in college, I gained 25 pounds. So I was well on my way to that eventual heart attack, I believe. Um, so I gave up hamburgers and hot dogs for about a week, and then I thought, okay, Dick Gregory is crazy. Nobody can do this. Who does this? This was 1986. Um, but I could not get what he said out of my mind. And I remember calling my mother and my, old, my middle sister, who was a... Um, a senior at Tufts University at the time and telling them that I heard this lecture and I thought I should become vegetarian. And during that time, I was being exposed in college. I was a um, political science black studies major. I was being exposed to all of these isms, to racism and sexism and homophobism, if that's a word, imperialism, um, capitalism. And I was questioning a lot of things that I was taught at Sidwell and things and learning things that I had never been taught. And so at the time, I was very open to questioning what the society dictated I should eat as well. So that's kind of what my mindset was at the time, and I was open to it as I was not open to it, uh, unlike um, seventh grade. So that summer, a few months later, I went home back to Washington, D.C read every book I could find in Martin Luther King Library and the Library of Congress about vegetarianism. My mother and my little sister read the same books and, this, and by the end of the summer, we decided that we should be vegetarian. Now, the problem is that I was taking my junior year away from Amherst. My first semester, I went to Nairobi, Kenya. My second semester, I went to Howard. So I was, arriving, I was arriving in Nairobi as a brand new vegetarian, okay? Had no idea what to eat, where to shop, nothing. And there were 30 students and the, I asked the directors of the program, can you serve me vegetarian food? And they were like, no, we cannot. You're gonna eat what we're serving the 29 other students in the program. So I ate the meat and dairy based um, diet, the food and it was delicious, it was much better than in the States. Even the hot dogs tasted fresh to me. So I enjoyed the food, but there were two things that made me know that I would become a vegetarian for real, for sure, when I got back home. The first happened when we went on um, safari for two weeks, and we stayed, we lived for two weeks with um, Samburus, and Samburus are like the cousins of the Maasai, you know, um, a lot of people are familiar with the Maasai, with, the, with their red capes, and the just beautiful, um, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience, one of the most beautiful of my life. And one night, we climbed up to um, a mountain cave, 
and we were going to stay there for two nights, and we took two live goats with us. Now, the day before, I had seen a goat being born. For the, I'd seen an animal being born with the Sanburu family that we were staying with, and I'd never seen anything being born before. I'd never seen anything giving birth before, so it lay, left a very strong impression. So the next day, we climb up to this mountain cave. The Samburu men kill the goat. They um, slit its throat. That's how they kill it. And then they had a bowl, or gourd, I guess. And they let the blood pour into the bowl. And they drank it. They drank from the blood from the bowl. And they invited us as their guests to do the same thing. So some of the other students drank the blood and they came up and made Dracula faces, you know, with the blood dripping down. So it was my turn to drink and I knelt down to drink the blood and then I stopped in mid-air and said, if somebody were to give me a glass of blood in the United States, I wouldn't drink it. So why am I doing it now just so I can go home and brag and say that I drank a glass of blood? So I didn't drink it and I said, well, I'm not going to eat the goat either. So they skinned the goat, they cut it up, they cooked it, they made goat stew. We were passing the bowls, it was smelling good, and I decided it looked good, I'm going to eat it. So I started to eat it, and the other goat was there tethered to a tree in front of me. And I felt guilty, and I wondered if it knew what had just happened to its companion. And I never had that thought before. So that was the first thing that made me know that I was going to become a vegetarian when I got back to the States. The second thing was on um, the last night of our safari, we went to this luxury game reserve and this, to this restaurant called The Carnivore. And at that time, they could actually serve some of the animals that were killed on safari. So they served us, we were at this very long wooden table with this huge plate on it in the middle. And four waiters came out carrying this animal that looked like an antelope or something that had been tied to this big branch and been roasted whole on a pit. So it was like something out of the Flintstones. They came and they plopped it down in the middle of the table and they started carving it. And it had its head and its eyes and its tail and it was the most disgusting thing I had, I, I had ever seen at that moment. And I didn't eat it. And that's when I decided for sure that I was going to be a vegetarian. I just couldn't do it. It was too big. It was too human-like to me to eat, seeing it like that. So when I came back home, I went to Howard University for the next semester and was living at home with my mom. and decided, okay, this is it. I'm going to be a vegetarian for real. And thankfully, there was a large community of African American vegetarians right up the street from Howard University. They had established the very first all vegan cafes and carryouts and stores in the nation's capital. Many of them had been influenced by Dick Gregory in the 70s. And I immersed myself in this community. I learned how to shop for vegan food, vegetarian food. I learned what to cook. My mother and I took cooking classes. We just soaked up everything. And so that summer while I was at, that, that uh, semester that I was at Howard and then the summer that followed, I learned so much, had so much hands-on experience with vegetarianism that I became very confident and very committed to this way of eating. So by, by the time I went back to Amherst for my senior year, I was a fully confident and committed vegetarian. And there's a whole other story about me trying to get off of the meal plan because they had no vegetarian anything at Amherst at that time. But I'll let you read that in the book, <laughs> That Struggle. So I ended up having to cook my own food. And luckily there was a bread and circus nearby, so I would catch the bus to bread and circus, buy my groceries, cook it down in the basement kitchen of the Charles Drew house that I lived, cover the plate of food, carry it across the street to the cafeteria to eat with my friends. Three meals a day, that's what I did for my senior year. I did not know any other vegetarians on campus. And as you know, it can get very, very cold in Massachusetts. So there were days where it was too cold for me to walk my plate of food over to the cafeteria. So I would sit 
in the Charles Drew house in the living room in front of the TV and eat my food. And it was very, very lonely. But at that point, I was already a committed vegetarian. So there was no turning back. And after I graduated, shortly thereafter, as a gift to myself, I decided to become a vegan. Now, the challenge for me there was cheese. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> cheese was my kryptonite. Love, 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 love cheese. And um, to this day, I still like the smell of cheese. I will go and sit in a pizza place with my friends. I won't eat it, but I'll smell it. And for me, that was purely mind over matter. I had to come to the point and finally came to the point where I decided that the momentary pleasure of a piece of cheese in my mouth was not worth the health risk because cheese is the biggest source of artery clogging saturated fat in the American diet. It just wasn't worth it. But it took me two years to realize that it wasn't worth it. So I understand that cheese of struggle. Um, so I mentioned my mom, and I just want to tell you that um, my mom was in her 50s when we all decided to become vegetarian that summer. And that's no small feat to make that decision in your 50s when you're from Camden, South Carolina. My mother is now 74 years old. She has no health problems whatsoever. No arthritis, no high cholesterol, no high blood pressure, no overweight, nothing. She exercises vigorously for at least an hour, six days a week. She still has her 37, 26, 37 inch figure. That is the PHAT fat I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, of my mother's 13 siblings, who, of the ones who survived into their senior year, she is the only one who has no chronic disease. And both of her parents died from chronic diseases. So she changed that entire dynamic, that entire paradigm in her family. And that is so, so important to understand because many, many people think that because your parents or your aunts or your uncles or your grandparents had some type of chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, that you are destined to have that as well. There is a saying that your DNA can load the trigger, but it's your diet, I'm sorry, your DNA can load the gun, but it's your diet that pulls the trigger. Your DNA can load the gun, but it's your diet that pulls the trigger. Your diet trumps your DNA. That's very, very crucial to get. Diet is everything. Nutrition is everything. It's more important than exercising, although exercising, of course, is very important. It's more important than stress, although relaxation and meditation and yoga and all of those things that you do to de-stress are very important. What you eat trumps everything. And so that's really the message that I want people to get in the book and when I talk and why I kind of took up this work because I'm very passionate about the fact that we are so misinformed in this society. And all I believe that people need is information. What they decide to do with the information is up to them. But if we don't have the correct information, if we don't understand that plant-based foods for more than four decades have been shown to be the healthiest foods to eat on the planet, if we don't know that, if we're not told that, we don't know that we have options. We don't know that there's something besides meat and dairy. And so that's the message, that's the information that I want to give out. Now, a lot of people may understand that eating whole grains and eating you know, beans and nuts, and, you know, these are ingredients, um, eating fresh fruits and vegetables are healthy. But they think, you know, if I do that and I give up meat and dairy, I'm gonna be sentenced to a life of bland food, right? Now, I don't come from the school of veganism being deprivation. I don't come from that school. I come from the school of veganism being joy, and veganism being abundance, and veganism being delicious. That's just how I learned about it. That's how I've lived it. And so, I don't, um, I don't subscribe to that. I eat great. I love food. I have always loved food, and I still love food. It may not look like it, but I can eat, and I enjoy eating. 
And so, um, I want to stress the point that you can eat deliciously and abundantly as a vegan. And really, in, in this day and age, it should go without saying that vegan food can be delicious as well as healthy. And I always like to tell people that if you can make a dead bird taste good, then you can make fresh, wholesome, plant-based foods taste delicious. It's all about the seasonings, okay? And so not only is it better for your own personal health, of course it's also best for the planet because um, the United Nations has issued now two reports saying that global warming is caused by um, livestock production, the production of the foods of the animals that we eat as food, the chickens and the pigs and the cows and the turkeys and the goats. The, the United Nations is saying that livestock production is responsible for more global warming emissions than all of the world's transportation combined. Two reports now saying that. And now, with the second report, they are encouraging the world's population to eat more plant-based foods and fewer meat and dairy products. So I am encouraging you all who are not vegan or who just want to eat more vegan foods to start doing that today. And there are some very easy ways to do that. The first is to add rather than take away. I always stress that. Add more dark leafy greens to your plate. That is the number one thing you can do. <coughs> more kale, more collards, more chard, more spinach, more mustards. Add those to your plate, make them a third of your plate at least twice a day, and you will be doing your body an enormous worth of good. The second thing is to eat whole grains. If you eat white rice, change to brown rice or black rice or red rice. Eat quinoa. How many people eat quinoa? Q-U-I-N-O-A. All right. Quinoa is fabulous. It is so high in protein, very easy to cook. Eat more of that. So many whole grains, just look them up and um, add those to your plate. Also, a lot of people think that eating plant-based foods, vegan foods, is expensive. That's a, that's a big challenge for folks. But if you eat from the bulk bin and you eat less from, packaged, um, from packages, from boxes, from plastic, it actually can be cheaper. It can be cheaper to have black bean chili to have burritos, to have uh, made with red beans, to have French lentils. If you buy them from the bulk bin and you get your rice and your grains from the bulk bin, rather than getting packaged meat that can cost up to $3 a pound, it really can be cheaper. Most people just need recipes and ideas. And there are tons and tons of vegan recipes on the internet available to you. I have 40 plus in my book that are all tested and delicious. So the other thing I suggest, a very easy tip, is to have a potluck. If you are afraid that, um, of getting in the kitchen, force yourself to have a potluck. Call five of your friends, choose a day, and say, we are all going to come together and serve each other vegan meals. Okay? We're all going to prepare a vegan dish and go to somebody's house. It will force you to get a recipe and get busy in the kitchen. You have to do that. The other thing is to go to vegan restaurants or restaurants that serve vegan food in your community and go with some girlfriends or some boyfriends or combination, whomever, and you all try the food. Sample the food. That's, the, that's a wonderful way to see what's out there available in your community if you don't have time to cook or you don't cook or your personal chef is off for the weekend, you know? So there are lots of ways to really get started tomorrow with eating more vegan foods. And that's really, really what I want to stress. So um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Who's my time person? I'm good? 10 minutes? OK. So um, I really breezed through that, but I wanted to leave some time for questions and answers because I think that's where we get a lot of valuable information as well. So um, actually. I'm sorry, before I take the first question, I have to acknowledge Dr. Paulette Chandler. Paulette, will you stand up? Paulette and I went to high school together, and she um, lives and works here in the Boston area um, as, as a doctor at Brigham Young. Brigham 
and women's, I apologize. And she and um, the Ministry of Life have generously volunteered to um, prepare my All Hail the Kale salad recipe, which is the most popular recipe in my book, even more than the cheesecake. So we have samples of that for you, thanks to their generosity. So I appreciate that. And I guess we can go ahead and, and start passing those out, if you like, while we take questions. Should we do that? OK. All right, so I'm going to open it up. Yes, ma'am, let's start with you. How are you? Hi, thank you. So thank you for this as well. Thank um, you. How would you travel Africa now? As a vegan. Oh, very good question. You know, on my um Oh yes, I'm sorry. How, the question is how would I travel Africa now? How would I do Africa as a vegan? Um, I have people on my um, blog, Twitter, and Facebook who are from Ghana and South Africa and other parts, um, Nigeria, who tell me how to do it if I want to come there and speak and do a book signing and eat vegan. So there are places, there are places that serve um, vegan foods and there are lots of farmers markets. It's a lot easier now. It's not as convenient as it is here. They're not like Whole Foods, you know. But um, the fresh food is definitely available. And they are telling me that they're able to do it. They're vegetarian and vegan societies in certain countries. So it's a lot easier now than it was um, 20 something years ago. Good question, thank you. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Yeah. Yes, two questions real quick. Okay. Um, I can't live without cereal because I like milk. You don't drink milk? And have you ever heard of cashew ice cream which is made with ground cashews and less of them? I have heard of cashew. Uh, the question is, um, do I drink milk? She cannot live without her cereal. <laughs> and have I heard of cashew ice cream that's made with less of them? Um, yes, I have heard of cashew ice cream. I have sampled all of the vegan ice creams. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, no, I don't drink milk. I used to drink soy milk. I don't drink soy milk anymore. Um, over the years, it started not to agree with me. Um, but I, I have a green smoothie in the morning, every morning, and I don't. I use water. I don't use. Um, I don't use the um, plant-based milks. But if I were to recommend plant-based milks, I would milks. I would start with hemp milk. There's almond milk. There's brown rice milk. There's um, um, coconut milk. There are lots of plant-based milks. There's oat. There's oat milk. So there are lots of options. I just had some rice milk over there, but it was white. Was that what you're talking about? You said almond milk. Yeah, you wanna you wanna look and make sure that in the ingredients that it's made with with brown. Um, they usually they usually are. Um, they usually, the, the milks are usually, the plant-based milks usually are, that are rice, usually are made with brown rice. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You and then you. You first. first. You first. It doesn't um, matter. <laughs> what do you think about the, like, meat alternatives that are made with, like, tofu and oh, different yeah. things, and how often do you eat them? The question is, what do I think about the meat alternatives that are made with to tofu, etc., and how often do I eat them? I think they are excellent as transition foods. They help you get over the hump. If you will not give up pepperoni, um, then um, try the vegan pepperoni. That's going to help you give up your pepperoni if you can get something that's made from a uh, plant-based source. Then eat that. If you need a vegan hot dog, a vegan hamburger, um, vegan cheese, eat that. If that's going to help you get over the hump, it is not. It is healthier than the animal-based alternatives. It is not a place to stay as the primary source of nutrients in your diet. Absolutely not. But it is really a good way for people to get over the hump. And it was a way for me to get over the hump. Now, um, I, I have a master's degree in public health nutrition. I know what is, you know, healthiest to eat. But I'm also very practical and real and know that it's not either or. I just know that that helps a lot of folks get over the hump. And so if it helps you, then I would say do it, but see it just as a, as a transition. Because they're very processed. A lot of them are high in fat. A lot of them are high in sodium. It's really not something that you want to stay. Um, if you're able to transition without eating those foods, that is the best way to do it and go straight 
to whole unpackaged foods, whole unprocessed foods. But a lot of folks aren't able to do that because they're so used to the texture of meat and dairy-based foods. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. So I was going to make a comment and mm -hmm. ask it in the form of a question. Okay. I know as a vegan, I find that lots of my vegan community and vegetarian mm -hmm. community need to hear part of that message as much as those outside of our community mm -hmm. in regard to plant-based diet mm -hmm. and not doing so much of the processed food yeah. and keeping it healthy. Yeah. And I wonder if you are finding that as you're traveling around and talking as well, hearing as many questions and that kind of thing. Yeah, the question is, um, the, and the comment is that um, vegans, people who are vegan, need to hear the message that these are just transition foods and they need to eat healthier vegan, healthier whole plant-based foods. And I absolutely see that that's true. And, you know, I, I, I uh, coach people, you know, to transition their diet. So um, this is absolutely what I see. Um, there is a... Um, unhealthy vegan diet. I mean, just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy, and hopefully you all know that. Um, so a lot of people who become vegan go back to being meat and dairy eaters because they feel unhealthy when they be, because they're eating unhealthy vegan diets. A lot of white um, flour, a lot of white bread, white rice, white pastas, a lot of sweets, a lot of the processed foods. Some people don't eat vegetables and fruit as vegans, you know, so it's very possible to eat an unhealthy vegan diet. So absolutely, there, people who are doing that as vegans need to step up their game and actually make sure that they're eating a healthy vegan diet. And uh, so yes, that's very, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to feedback on what you just said. Okay. Can you offer some tips for people who want to be a vegetarian but who are having who are gaining weight or not able to lose weight. I have several friends who are vegetarian and, and two of them who are vegan, but they are still, at the time I've known them to be vegan, they've gained weight yeah. because they've taken the protein out of their diet mm -hmm. and they've filled up with carbs and other stuff, sweets maybe, mm -hmm. to, you know, to make up the, to fill the void. Right. Right. So what would you recommend that they do to eat healthier and kind of balance their protein with their carbohydrates. And what do you feel is a good carbohydrate protein now? Okay. <laughs> um, what is a well what is a plate of um, a well balanced vegan meal look like? Can I say that? That's great. Okay. So I think for um, that's not a lot of processed food. I think a third, at least a third of the plate should be a dark leafy green. If you can make it half of the plate as your foundation, do that. But that's what you're working towards. Then you can have a whole grain. You can have, um, gosh, they, I have a, like in my prepared speech, I have like a list of 10 whole grains. But you can have any of the whole grains. And as the quote unquote protein, you know, protein is in everything, even the whole grains that are on your plate. But a lot of people in their mind think, what am I going to replace the pork chop or the ham or the turkey or the steak with? So you can have um, lots of things. You can, if you want to eat um, uh, chili or if you want to eat lentils, like I said earlier, if you want to have a burrito, if you want to have um, uh, tofu skewers, um, if you want to have baked tofu, if you want to have um, uh, curry chickpeas, there's so many. There are so many different types of foods that you can make, and it's all about the spices. So normally, I say start with the beans and the and the legumes, even before you start with tofu. I actually don't eat that much tofu anymore. Um, I eat it, but primarily I eat legumes now. My diet is a lot simpler after 23 years. You know. So I would say to add some kind of legume to your plate. The easiest, highest source of protein are the lentils. Um, so, and they're very easy to cook. So you can have those in lots of different ways. You can have them in um, a, a samosa. You can have them, um, like I said, in a chili. You can make them cold in a salad. There are lots of what you can curry them, lots of things you can do with them. The, the sky is the limit. So that's what I would say to start with the whole grain, a third or a half the plate as greens, and then have legumes. And then after that, 
you know, with the legumes, if you want to have like the veggie burger or something like that, one of the, you know, the processed meats, that kind of thing. If you need that, then do that, but don't eat that every day. And the other thing is, I have a friend who became vegan with me at Howard. Um, I mean, vegetarian with me and then vegan later. And he actually now is obese. And he, um, I won't call his name. <laughs> and, um, but we, you know, we talk about this. He overeats and does not exercise. And he overeats a lot of the processed high fat, high sugar, vegan foods. He gains weight. You know, I mean, it's, that's just it. You have to be conscious of being healthy even as a vegan. So, um, and you have to exercise. So hopefully that answers.